Chapter 6, The University as an Institution. The university fulfills its tasks, research, instruction, training, communication, within an institutional framework. It requires buildings, materials, books, and institutes, and their orderly administration. Privileges and duties must be distributed among its members. The university represents an independent corporate whole with its own constitution. The university exists only to the extent that it is institutionalized. The idea becomes concrete in the institution. The extent to which it does this determines the quality of the university. Stripped of its ideal, the university loses all value. Yet institution necessarily implies compromises. The idea is never perfectly realized. Because of this, a permanent state of tension exists at the university between the idea and the shortcomings of the institutional and corporate reality. The failure of the institution to live up to the idea of the university. Even the best institutions of the university are apt to deteriorate and become distorted. Thus, the very translation of thought into teachable form tends to impoverish its intellectual vitality. Once intellectual achievements is admitted into the body of accepted learning, those achievements tend to assume an air of finality. Thus, it is merely a matter of convention at what point one subject ends and another begins. It is possible, moreover, that an excellent scholar may not be able to find a place for himself within the established departmental divisions. A mediocre scholar may be preferred to him simply because his work fits into the traditional scheme. Any institution tends to consider itself an end in itself. Though an institutional structure is indispensable to the progress and transmission of research, only constant re-examination can ensure its proper functioning on behalf of the ideal it is meant to serve. For administrative organizations are notoriously intent upon perpetuating themselves. Ostensibly, the university's vested freedom to select its own new members favors the choice of the best. In practice, however, this system tends to favor the second best. Not only the university, but all corporate bodies tend to maintain an unconscious solidarity against both the excellent and mediocre, prompted by such anti-intellectual motivations as fear of competition and jealousy. The excellent are instinctively excluded from fear of competition, just as the inferior are rejected out of concern for the prestige and influence of the university. The competent, the second rate, are selected people who are on the same intellectual level as oneself. This is one more reason why appointments to vacant professorships cannot be left exclusively to the departments concerned, but must be subject to control by a third party. As Jay Grimm has said, the state has no business allowing the supervision of academic appointments to slip out of its hands. Allowing each faculty to appoint its own members would contradict the greater part of common experience. Fear of competition exerts a certain force even over men with the most honest of motives. Faithful decisions are made when the institution selects new appointees from the younger generation. The university is by no means accessible to anyone who has made intellectual contributions. Access is provided by a senior professor in Germany, an ordinarius, who must sponsor the appointment before the faculty. Professors are inclined to prefer their own disciples in matters of appointment if they do not indeed limit access to them entirely. On the strength of the sheer duration of their study, under a given professor, these students feel that they have earned the right to academic appointment, a right which they claim unjustly, but which the professor recognizes for reasons of personal sympathy. Professors are sought after who have the reputation of finding academic jobs for their students. Max Weber tried to curb this unwholesome practice by proposing the principle that whoever had taken this doctorate under one senior professor should be required to seek academic employment under another senior man at another university. When he tried to apply this equitable principle to his own students, however, he discovered at once that one of his own students met with flat disbelief when applying for a position at another institution, and that people preferred to believe that Weber had rejected his own student as incompetent. A professor still incurs grave guilt when he favors his own students by exaggerating their real stature and performance where new appointments are involved. There must be no compromise with the principle that quality and quantity of scholarly production govern the selection of new appointees. Otherwise, the decline of the university is assured. It occurs when a poor appointment policy favors mere studiousness over independent thinking, 
and substitutes a civil service type of automatic promotion for the risk of securing professional approval by independent achievement. Whereas many teachers tend to favor this sort of studiousness, which is unlikely to upset the routine or offer serious competition, every professor should make it his principle to allow only those students to become members of the faculty whom he can expect to attain at least the same level of proficiency as himself. He should be on the lookout for those who might surpass him, go far beyond him, and advance these men, even if they are not his own students. Institutions can easily become the tools of scholars who desire power and use their reputations, connections, and friends to advance certain people more or less ruthlessly. Since Hegel's time, the authority wielded by the respective heads of an entire school of thought has been the target of constant complaint. Free communication, which ideally prevails at the university, all too often degenerates into a quarrel between conflicting personalities. Jealousy and envy lead to unfairly destructive criticism. Even during the most culturally advanced periods of the 19th century, such abuses flourished. Goethe recognized this sickness in the university when he compared it with independent research. Quote, Here, as everywhere, learning advances quietly or dramatically, while those professionally concerned with it are not really interested in it at all, but are merely interested in money and personal power. And they hate and persecute one another about nothing at all, as all can see, because no one wants to tolerate anyone else, although they could all live very comfortably if everyone lived and let live." End quote. It is one of the maxims of the sensible university teacher never to acknowledge purely negative criticism or the intrigues which grow out of it, to deal with it as if it were non-existent, or at least to blunt its impact so that fruitful cooperative work may continue to flourish in the interests of the university as a whole. Paradoxically, the unlimited freedom in research and teaching, to which each member of the university is ideally entitled, serves not only to promote that unrestricted communication which exposes everyone to radical doubt, but it also promotes a tendency to enclose the specialist in his field, to make him untouchable, to isolate him instead of encouraging him to communicate. Everybody leaves everyone else greater liberties so as to be entitled to them himself and to be safe from the meddling of others. The conduct of faculty members has been compared with that of the monkeys on the palm trees of the holy grove of Benares. On every palm tree sits a monkey. All seem to be very peaceful and minding their own business. But the moment one monkey tries to climb up the palm tree of another, he runs into a heavy barrage of coconuts. Similarly, mutual respect in university circles tends to, to a state of affairs where everyone may indulge his every inclination or caprice, with the result that the university no longer centers on matters of common concern. Common concern is tactfully reserved for formal occasions. Thus, it can happen that everybody approves everyone else's candidates for academic appointment simply in order to have freedom in this matter oneself. Basic criticism is avoided. Communication, which ought to be an intellectual battle for clarity and substance, becomes a purely outward relationship governed solely by considerations of politeness. There is, to be sure, some wisdom in this. The individual scholar's intellectual productivity must be assured freedom to the point of allowing for what to some contemporaries seem eccentricities or license. Though discussion and criticism must naturally accompany the work of a scientist or scholar, Official exercise of criticism for the sake of controlling individual research and teaching, whether of professor, lecturer, or even student, is intolerable. In all matters extending beyond the personal realm and involving the interests of a department or the university as a whole, mutual discussion becomes a duty, particularly in the case of new appointments. In the personal realm, there is no substitute for spontaneous and informal discussion for genuine communication in accordance with the idea of the university. It marks the presence of genuine intellectuality of the kind that is no respecter of persons. It is a tragic paradox that academic freedom tends to obliterate this ultimate freedom of true communication, the necessity for institutions. These and other shortcomings of the institutional structure do not obviate the need for institutionalization in some form. Without an institution, the life and work of the individual scholar are in danger of being wasted. Life and work should become part of a tradition safeguarded along institutional lines so that later generations can profit by them. Scientific achievements in particular are dependent on material means which the individual seldom has at his disposal. They are also dependent on the sort of cooperation possible only at a permanent institution. This is why we cherish the university as institution. 
why we love it to the extent that it manages to incarnate this ideal. Despite all its shortcomings, it is the locus of this ideal. It assures us that a community of scholars can exist. There is special satisfaction in belonging to such an institution, if only for honor's sake. It hurts not to be admitted to it or to be expelled by it. Students and professors ought not to consider the university as a mere chance institution of society, nor as a mere school a production line of necessary degrees. They ought to assimilate the idea of the university, that Western supranational idea of Greco-German origin. This idea is not something that can be touched, seen, or heard. It glimmers in the ashes of institution, flaring up from time to time in individuals or groups. One need not always belong to a university to live by its ideal. But the idea is attracted to the institution, without which it feels incomplete, sterile and isolated. To live according to this idea means becoming part of a larger whole. All this, however, must not be allowed to lead to the arrogant assumption that the university is the sole and proper place for an intellectual life. We who love the university as the place in which we lead our lives may not forget the special nature and limitations of the university. In many cases, what it creates comes into being outside the university. It is at first rejected by the university, then adopted, and so on, until it becomes its own. Renaissance humanism grew outside of and opposed to the scholastic universities. When the universities had become humanistic, then philologically oriented, the revival of philosophy and the natural sciences in the 17th century again had its source outside of the university, with men such as Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Pascal and Kepler. When the philosophy of Christian Wolff and his disciples had penetrated the university, a new humanism arose whose chief exponents were Winckelmann, Lessing, and Goethe, again outside the university. This humanism, however, quickly conquered the university because of great philologists such as F. A. Wolff. Smaller movements, too, often arise outside the university and are long ignored by it. Examples are Marxist sociology, hypnotism, long since accepted as a recognized field, graphology, just beginning to be taken note of at the university, and introspective psychology as developed by Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. As J. Grimm writes, our universities are places where a large and ever-growing book learning is present, yet they tend to ignore any radically new piece of work until it has proved its validity elsewhere. Universities are like gardens, where wild growths are only reluctantly tolerated. Still, once a new intellectual direction has been developed, the university will take possession of it sooner or later, promote further development by new discoveries and application, and preserve it as part of its body of teachable materials. Yet it can only teach a subject in which it does independent research. This is exactly what happened at the university again and again. In several notable instances, however, the universities have pioneered new directions of thinking. Foremost among these are the Kantian philosophy and the philosophy of German idealism, which followed in its wake. Moreover, throughout the 19th century, almost all new discoveries in history and the natural sciences originated at the university. The role of personality within the formal structure of the university. The ultimate problem posed by the institutional structure of the university is the place of human beings in it. For its vitality, the university depends on persons, not institutions, which are no more than a physical prerequisite. The university is judged by its ability to attract the best people and provide them with the most favorable conditions for research, communication, and teaching. Tensions between the living personality of the research scholar and institutional forms are unavoidable. Where the idea of the university remains vitally alive, this results in creative change. Times of conservatism alternate with times of rapid change. No idea can be realized without being modified. Institutions, laws, and conventions have a way of obtruding themselves. Once the idea disappears, only meaningless routine is left. The things that matter cannot be forcibly brought into being by institutional dictates. It is always dangerous when an institution tries to reproduce artificially something that can only grow organically. The really important contributions are made only by those who commit their lives to the service of truth over an unbroken period of years and decades. Administrators can be judged by the relative importance they attach to persons or institutions. It takes people to instill life into an institution. The mere survival and continued functioning of certain ancient institutions reflects a deep wisdom. Yet even this wisdom is to a large measure 
dependent on the quality of its present members. Thus, individual personality and institutions are interdependent. Their polarity is never without tension. Institutions are purposeful mechanisms devised to make a transaction of business safer and surer. They establish those forms which, until altered deliberately, retain unquestioned validity. To abide by these forms and rules is one of the conditions of intellectual work. It provides foundation and order. Formal regulations should be limited to these foundations, and even then be as sensible as possible so as to encourage cheerful compliance until they become second nature. In so complying, one actually enhances one's freedom. In every institution, there are differences of rank and authority above and beyond the obvious differences of individual caliber. Rational organization is unthinkable without leadership. The original way was for students to gather around a teacher formally. Today, a director of research supervises his institute and assistants in an intellectual manner. This is bearable and even desirable only if the man in charge is at the same time the outstanding intellect. In permanent institutions, that is a matter of luck. What is intolerable is the rule of incompetence who want to compensate for their lack of intelligence and dissatisfaction with themselves by gratifying their power drives. Productive people who have a talent for leadership are excellent for this job. Aware of their own limitations, they will leave their subordinates all possible freedom in the hope that these go even further than they themselves. No institution by itself is ever satisfactory. It is corrupted by the addition of complicated refinements and institutional procedure. Simplicity is the most difficult thing to achieve. Premature simplification oversimplifies. Complex relationships are not resolved but destroyed by simple solutions, such as separating research from teaching institutes, pure applied science, liberal education from specialized training, the instruction of the best from that of the many. Genuine intellectual life occurs only where teaching and research do not simply exist side by side but go hand in hand. This is an idea which can only be realized by the work of complete persons. The polarity of person and institution begets opposite errors. On the one hand, there is the cult of personality, the emphasis on originality and even eccentricity. On the other hand, there is an emphasis on oppressive and empty organization. Both extremes lead to unreasonableness in one case because of tradition for tradition's sake, in the other because of innovation for the sake of innovation. The university's attitude is hard to formulate. It aims to steer clear of either extreme. It tolerates individual eccentricities. It is receptive to new personalities and providing a meeting ground of the greatest extremes. Individuals are important even where there is no cult of personality because ideas are realized only through the individual effort of people. There is a sense for rank and merit at the university and a feeling of respect for age. The individual scholar wants to feel welcome among his colleagues, elected by, not forced upon, them. Thank you for listening to this audio recording by David McCarricker, published by Theory Underground. This work has been placed in the public domain because of its importance. I hope that you all enjoy this during your holidays in its small daily doses, like an advent calendar. And that if you are intrigued to hear lectures on the topic of the idea of the university, then I hope you will consider joining the course that I am leading with Brian Weeks and Ann Snellgrove, the three of us, all educators, interested in the idea of higher education and a kind of learning environment that cares about the freedom of individuals to be able to research what they find most interesting as opposed to what big business or political partisans think you ought to be researching. I'm going to actually show you all really quick what the website looks like. So you go to theory-underground.com. Make sure to register with the website and then go to courses right here. You can also go to events and get to it that way. And then right here you see Mikey teaches Zizek for they know not what they do. That's a class that kicks off in February. We also have professional managerial class consciousness that's kicking off at the end of January. And I'm teaching that one with Elton. And then the idea of the university right here. All three of these are courses that you can add to your shopping cart and choose to take if you want. But the idea of the university, if you click on it, if you're not already logged in, then this is what you should see. Click take this course, click add to cart, view cart, and then proceed to checkout. Oh, one quick thing, don't forget, 
I guarantee the verification email will be sent to your spam folder. So if you're going, I tried to sign up with their website. I registered and everything. I just didn't never get the, I never got the email. Uh, don't worry. It's in your spam folder. You just have to find it. And you might not be able to find it from your phone. You might have to actually sit down at a laptop. I'm sorry. It's not always as easy as giant mega corporations make it when you try to do stuff underground. So go for it. Try it out. Let me know if it works. Okay, bye. So anyway, that's how you do it. I hope to see you there in the discussions on the Zoom chat, but also in the forums where the real conversation will hopefully be taking place on the website. Anyway, everyone, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Take care.